Hello and uh, good morning. Um, I will just start uh, with some introductions. I'm very conscious uh, lots of people are due to be joining the webinar uh, just at the moment. Um, I'll start with one bit of housekeeping, which I'll probably repeat a few times um, over the next couple of minutes um, as uh, as a very large number of people joining, uh, which is, uh, in my experience, if you open the participants list for the webinar, it will stop the pop up that you get otherwise over your screen um, each time somebody joins the uh, uh, joins the webinar. Um, good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Ben Troke. I'm a partner at uh, Hill Dickinson Solicitors, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome so many of you uh, to this session on the Liberty Protection Safeguards. Um, I will start with just uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, as I say, I'm conscious that we have uh, uh, a great many people continuing uh, to to join us. Um, this is built as a follow up um, here in, in October. We first ran a webinar on this topic um, three months ago, exactly on the 7th of uh, July. Uh, and of course, one of the things we'll be talking about today is how much things have moved on and how much they haven't. Um, and if not, why not? Uh, and when we might find out. Uh, a little bit more and no doubt um, there'll be another uh, session to talk about um, the progression towards implementation uh, in another few months. Um, let me start with those bits of housekeeping because of the numbers of people uh, joining the webinar, um, the microphones and cameras are off for all the uh, delegates. Um, please do use the chat box uh, to put your questions in to us um, and we will deal with those at the end of the session. Um, the session is being recorded and a copy of the recording and a copy of the presentation slides will be sent to everybody um, after the session. Um, my other bit of advice for housekeeping um, is, uh, as I say, just to open the participants box, which will stop pop up. Um, of each person who is uh, joining uh, the session coming up over your screen. Um, as I say, put your questions into the chat box, please. At the end of the session, I'll, I'll remind you of that when we get to the questions and answers uh, bit. Um, and at that point, perhaps if you do want to ask a question uh, verbally, if you can raise your hand, it might be we can pick you out of um, the uh, participants and uh, enable you to unmute yourself, uh, and speak to us if that's going to work better than putting a question. Uh, into the uh, chat box. So here's what we're going to cover over the next um, hour or so. Um, welcome and uh, introduction. Um, well, that's me. Um, thank you very much for for uh, so many of you coming along today, and particular thanks to our friends and colleagues at 360 Assurance and uh, Tian, the internal uh, audit network. Um, who've extended the uh, invitation to the session to their uh, networks as well. Delighted to see so many people uh, here today. Uh, and I'll say a word or two to set the scene uh, in a moment in an introductory uh, slide. Um, and then uh, delighted to welcome two external speakers. We have Tim Spencer Lane, um, who has been involved uh, in this uh, issue for um, quite a few years uh, now, uh, led on the Law Commission's review uh, of the law of this area, continues to work um, on the development of the regulations. So delighted to welcome uh, Tim here today. Um, and then a second speaker is Kenny Gibson, who's the head of uh, national safeguarding uh, for NHS England. Um, and we'll close the session with hopefully a bit of time for some, some Q&A, uh, as I say, through the chat box or hands up um, as best we can. Um, just one slide from me to set the scene, um, if I can. Um, if you came to the session that we did in July, um, you'll remember that I used this uh, idea of, uh, of waiting for Godot, um, all of us having this sense of, uh, of waiting around for something that's starting to feel like it might never happen. Um, and uh, sadly, uh, three months on, uh, there's there's plenty of people who still um, have that sense. Um, the latest official announcement, subject to Tim um, telling me otherwise, um, is that the uh, the code of practice and the draft regulations out for consultation, uh, the flesh on the bones 
um, of the Liberty and Protection Safeguards um, were were supposed to be out in spring um, of this year. I've heard a rumour that it was then going to be September, but it was only a rumour. Uh, and of course, September's come and gone uh, as well, and it doesn't feel too spring-like out at the moment. Um, you'll have your own view on how plausible that makes the official current deadline of uh, for implementation of April 2022. Um, but we will uh, we will see um, about that. Um, so we have a very large and a diverse audience, um, but um, a, a large proportion of that is um, from uh, our NHS contacts and clients. Uh, so I'll be delighted to listen to Kenny Gibson talking about preparations uh, from the NHS perspective in particular. Uh, but first, I'm going to hand over to Tim Spencer Lane to uh, update us on what we do know, um, why we don't yet know any more than that, and when we might know more, um, I hope. So uh, over to you, uh, Tim, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. I, I fear I'm going to disappoint you once again um, on the loss of those scores. Um, but anyway, um, welcome everyone to, to the seminar to talk about the Liberty Protection Safeguards. Um, I, I'm sorry, Ben, are you going to be moving my slides forward? Thank you. Can I go forward? Thank you. So I, I may, we may as well start them. We may, may as well go there straight away. What on earth has happened to the LPS code and regulations, um, which is obviously the um, the question on the on the on the lips of the nation. Um, and I haven't got, got a very good um, answer for you, I'm afraid, on that particular question. As Ben rightly says, the official announcement from government was that it was due out in the spring. It certainly ain't spring at the moment, um, unless, of course, they meant next spring, which they didn't because they said uh, spring of this year. Um, so what on earth has happened? Well, um, we don't know, but there are at least um, three developments that have helped, um, I imagine, have helped to delay things. We've had, obviously, the um, issues around COVID, which haven't he helped the department. We've also had, um, I imagine, government attention being taken away in other areas of policy, particularly the cap on care costs, which um, has taken up a lot of uh, ministerial and civil service time. Plus, I imagine not helping matters has been uh, the reshuffle and new ministers, a clean sweep, in fact, of ministerial responsibilities across um, the Department of Health and Social Care and the Ministry of Justice, which leads on the uh, Mental Capacity Act. So um, I don't know if those of you who've worked with civil servants or even in central government will know that briefing ministers takes a very long time, particularly during party conference seasons. So a lot of things tend to get slowed up there. So I imagine that's all thrown into it, but I don't have any any um, reveals for you in terms of when the code and the regulations will come up for consultation, I'm afraid. Can I go to the next slide, please, Ben? So, um, all I can do for you is to, I guess, run through um, uh, what we know about the LPS in terms of the basic legal framework, what we do know in terms of the department's policy, and maybe highlight a few key issues that um, that needs to be addressed in terms of the um, codes and the regulations. So this first slide is simply some of the basic principles which have informed the development of the um, liberty protection safeguards. I mean, th these aren't legal principles in, in the same way that um, uh, as those set out in Section 1 of the Mental Capacity Act, but these are sort of policy statements which sort of inform the, 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 the general procedure. So the first basic principle of the LPS is that deprivation of liberty is everyone's business. In other words, it's no longer this sort of specialised, rather esoteric role. Um, it should be something, deprivation of liberty should be something that all frontline care and um, health staff can recognise and, and more importantly, can respond to when it's looking likely that a person's circumstance amounts to a deprivation of liberty. Next one, please, Ben. Sort of linked to that is the notion that um, consideration should be um, mainstreamed, moved to the front line. So this isn't a thing that's done to the person at the end of a process by some specialist team that's parachuted in. 
um, frontline social workers or nurses or doctors should be able to complete the assessments alongside their existing uh, uh, processes. So, you know, when, when you're doing a care act to move someone in the care home, for example, you're also building into that, that assessment, the, um, the, the, some of the assessments around deprivation of liberty um, as well. Next one, please, Ben. And an important part of the liberty protection safeguards is, of course, that um, the role of the Court of Protection uh, gets reconfigurated. So it's no longer a body that should give an authorization for deprivation of liberty. That, in principle, is a decision made by um, the NHS or a local authority. What the court becomes is the body to which the person can appeal against the, their authorization. So it doesn't give the authorization in the first place anymore, as it does at the moment under community dolls, for example. So um, here we go, liberty protection safeguards. Um, you may well know a lot of this, but this is my uh, very, very, very high level summary of what they will actually do um, and how they will change things. So the basic starting point is that they are setting neutral. So unlike the dolls, they go beyond hospitals and care homes. So you can um, authorise deprivation of liberty in any setting uh, where Article 5 is engaged. So that may well include domestic settings, the person's own home, shared lives accommodation, all sorts of, all sorts of different sorts of placements may be covered by the liberty protection safeguards. Secondly, they don't end necessarily when the person moves between different settings. So you, to some extent, they're portable. So, for example, if a person is living at home and needs to go into respite care on a regular basis, you can, you can um, draft your authorised arrangements in such a way to cover those different arrangements, if you can sort of reasonably foresee them at the point in time um, at which you give the authorisation. Thirdly, um, it includes for the first time 16 and 17 year olds. So at the moment that group is excluded from the doles, but this, these, this group will be included um, within the liberty protection safeguards. So that um, brings in potentially a lot of new settings, including children's homes, for example, um, uh, uh, potentially secure accommodation, um, family centres, residential educational placements, etc, etc. So we, um, again, you can use liberty protection safeguards in those sorts of settings. Responsibility for deprivation of liberty is shared out. It's no longer just a local authority thing. The NHS also becomes responsible for certain cases, mainly cases where deprivation of liberty is happening in a NHS hospital and also where the person is in receipt of NHS continuing health care. So in those cases, an NHS body would be the responsible body. All other cases, including self-funders living in the community, would be the responsibility of the local authority. And it's based around three assessments um, that needs to be commissioned by the responsible body, a capacity assessment, uh, a medical assessment, which simply confirms that the person has a mental disorder and confirmation that the arrangements giving rise to a deprivation of liberty are necessary and are proportionate. And some cases will get what's referred to as enhanced scrutiny by uh, a new professional role called the approved mental capacity professional. So generally speaking, they'll be involved in cases where the person or someone on, on their behalf is clearly unhappy with the arrangements that are being put in place. And there will continue to be rights for the person to represent, um, to be represented and supported by an independent mental capacity advocate, or if there's a family member or, a, or an informal carer who's able and will, willing to advocate on the person's behalf, that person can be appointed as what's called their appropriate person. And they will be responsible for protecting the person's rights, both during the assessment and for the duration of any um, authorization that's given. So that was my um, summary of the liberty protection safeguards. Of course, we know that because it's all in the legislation. 
what else do we know about the liberty protection safeguards going forward? Well, the first thing we know is that um, there will be a single code of practice which covers both the Mental Capacity Act and the Liberty Protection Safeguards. So there will no longer be two separate um, codes. Uh, um, they'll be put together seamlessly into a single document, which is really good news in terms of integrating the Liberty Protection Safeguards into the Mental Capacity Act. Really bad news if you want to print it out and carry it about with you, because it's going to be a whopping great document, um, I, can, I can assure you. So. Um, uh, and it will be out for consultation, so you'll, 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 I'm sure everyone will be, will be, will enjoy uh, reading that um, as well. But anyway, it's going to be a single code. We've had confirmation about that. We also know that um, that CCGs are on their way out, which is really annoying because, of course, CCGs are one of the responsible bodies for the purposes of the liberty protection safeguards. So the health and care bill currently going through Parliament proposes to replace them with integrated care systems. This obviously may well cause problems on the ground because the, because the responsibilities, most of the responsibilities of CCGs will be um, transferred to the integrated care systems. And it is possible that this will all happen at the same time as the LPS is being implemented. So, um, you know, that, that, that will be challenging to say the least. We also know that the Mental Health Act interface is not going to be amended. So the government originally said that um, it would uh, consider implementing the Simon and Wesley recommendations for a new interface between the uh, Mental Health Act and the Mental Capacity Act. That didn't go down very well at consultation, so the government has confirmed that it will retain the existing interface, which in turn sort of retains the existing interface between the Doles and the um, and the Mental Health Act. And finally, the government have already announced um, who will be responsible for monitoring the operation of the LPS in England and reporting on that um, at least annually. So CQC, unsurprisingly, will be responsible for adults um, uh, under the Liberty Protection Safeguards, but al also Ofsted will be given a, um, a new role in terms of monitoring uh, LPS in relation to 16 and 17 year olds. So that's something we do know, I guess. We also know what about the transitional arrangements as well. So let's assume for one moment that the new scheme does come to pass on the 1st of April 2022. Although, as Ben says, you could argue that that is highly unlikely given the um, timetabling concern. But let's, just, let's assume for a moment that would happen. The government's intention is that from the 1st of April 2022, or whenever it may be, there will be no new Dole's authorizations that can be made. Instead, if you happen to be on a existing Dole's authorization on the 31st of March, that will continue until it expires. So that could be for up to a year afterwards. You'd have the two schemes sort of working in tandem alongside each other. In other words, new cases have to go on the LPS. Existing cases will go on to the Dole's until that Dole's expires. Within that time as well, obviously, there will be court of protection cases, cases authorised by the court of protection, which will need to be transferred to a responsible body. Um, so during that transitional period, there will also need to be a process in place for that to happen. And, you know, it's probably likely that some sort of practice direction will be issued by the court of protection in terms of how responsible bodies and when responsible bodies will be alerted um, to new cases. What else we know is the government's initial intention, at least in relation to who will be carrying out the assessments. Now, this is quite an old um, uh, slide that was published by the Department of Health and Social Care. So we don't know for certain if this is going to appear in the regulations, but this certainly was the department's intention um, some months ago in terms of who carries out the assessments. So you can see when it comes to the capacity assessment, and the necessary and proportionate assessment, the government's policy has been that that 
can only be carried out by a doctor, a registered nurse, an OT, a social worker, psychologist, or a speech and language therapist. When it comes to the medical assessment, the intention has been that that can only be carried out by a uh, doctor or a registered psychologist. In terms of AMCPs, the intention was that that would be limited to nurses, social workers, psychologists, speech and language therapists, and um, registered OTs. So again, I emphasize that uh, we don't know if this will appear in the secondary legislation, this specific list, but that certainly has been the government's intention. So it won't be that much different uh, to that, but we'll have to see when the government does eventually publish its regulations for public consultation. And finally, I thought I might, you know, given I, my, my presentation is so inadequate, given I can't tell you anything useful about the code, I thought I would just highlight some key issues, some things to look out for when the code eventually does uh, come out. Um, one of the key things is, of course, the definition chapter. So what I mean by that is the definition of deprivation of liberty. What will that chapter say about the government's interpretation of Cheshire West and all the other issues um, around the uncertainty of deprivation of liberty. Um, so I think that you know that will be a, a chapter to, to, to very much um, focus on when the code does come out. Secondly, assessments. The government did during the passage of the bill talk about having time limits for assessments placed in the um, in the code of practice rather than on the face of, of the of the act. So will we see the, a replication of the existing system whereby a, the expectation would be that they're carried out within 21 days, for example? Now, we know in practice that's an absolute fiction. Um, assessments rarely get completed uh, within 21 days, days these days, but will that be repeated in the code? There's also, also an issue about the role of GPs. So the, 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 the medical assessment is no longer limited to psychiatrists. So then does that mean that GPs will ex be expected via the code to undertake uh, the medical assessment or to, to, to pick up on previous assessments? Um, fourthly, what about fluctuating capacity? Uh, the Law Commission's original bill had a whole separate procedure governing how authorizations could be given where the person's likely to regain capacity. Again, will the code say anything about how practitioners should deal with fluctuating capacity? And then there'll be quite a lot of interesting stuff, I, ma I imagine, around um, approved mental capacity professionals. So outside of objection cases, for example, when what other cases could be referred to an approved mental capacity professional? What about this idea of the AMCP service? In the Law Commission's bill, there, there was this idea that every local authority should establish a core team, um, of, of a service for AMCPs to sort of insulate them from the pressure from responsible bodies. Will that be taken forward in the code? And outside of AMCPs, who will be the other sort of reviewer in non-objection cases? Finally, the other an, a, another interesting issue is who from the responsible body should give the authorization. And indeed, could that be an assessor, for example, or even the pre-authorization reviewer? So a lot of open questions about who on behalf of the responsible body can give the authorization. Anyway, that's it from me. Um, in terms of my whistle-stop whistle tour of the Liberty Protection Safeguards. Ben, is it back to you now? Um, yes, but only just to say, uh, Tim, thank you uh, ever so much for, for that. I'm sure there'll be uh, plenty of questions. Um, in fact, I can see questions have been coming and going in the, the chat box. And thank you to Kenny for fielding most of the questions uh, as you've been talking, Tim, as far as I can, uh, uh, I can see. Tim, I hope you're able to stick around for the rest of the session. Brilliant. That will uh, that will be very helpful uh, indeed. Um, thank you so much for that. Let me pass on to Kenny. And uh, since uh, you'll be speaking, Kenny, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat box. Uh, now I won't be ticking through the slides uh, since um, you've just got this one, which I hope everybody can uh, can read. Kenny, thank you very much. I'll pass on to thank you. you.
<clears throat> Thank you for those that haven't met me before. Hello, my name is Kenny Gibson and I'm the National Head of Safeguarding for the NHS. Really the, the, the chief listener in the implementation of, of LPS. And uh, I just want to uh, bear witness to the fact that maybe it's a good job we didn't go live in the summer. Uh, having dealt with COVID, we're all exhausted now. So uh, I, I think as part of the advocacy towards implementing LPS from April 2022, um, I, I think the timing is right for one of these uh, events. So thank you very much for the invite. All right, NHS. What I'm going to update you on is the current position, not only across the NHS, which is massive and huge, but also independent providers with an NHS contract. I see several people here who are not solely from NHS organisations per se, but their organisation will hold an NHS contract as part of their independent provider status, and they are CQC uh, compliant as well. So we want to talk about that. Uh, this is a seminal moment across the NHS all one uh, all 6.4 sorry 1.6 million of us that work in the NHS that includes primary care it includes care in our homes it includes community services and it includes hospital services specialized and otherwise 1.6 million of us have the humbling privilege of wearing an NHS lanyard and there are far, far more of us in the independent sector as well we need to understand what the code says before we can take affirmative action. We must move together. The NHS cannot afford unwarranted variation on how this massive change of uh, human rights, of making every contact count across the NHS. And so we have stood up a clinical reference group. This always happens when there is a massive commission to be happening. And so this this clinical reference group has been stood up. It meets monthly. There are representatives from all levels of the NHS and independent health providers from across England and the NHS and Wales as well, because obviously it impacts um, the Welsh system as well. We are also sitting and we dovetail into the national, the Department of Health, MCA and Liberty Protection Safeguards implementation group. So the voice comes through you all all 376 people on this call comes through your regional safeguarding leads or your LPS forums locally, comes into the clinical reference group. I hear it, I take it to the department. And so we we need that process so that I, I understand what the pressures are, I understand what the anxieties are, but I also have to say my job is to calm the drama. The NHS has been here before. We've been here before. We have implemented PREVENT. We have implemented FGM. We have implemented many, many statutory safeguarding functions. We may not be there for health and support needs per se, but we have implemented huge amounts of transformation across the NHS, but we need to do it together. And we need to do it collaboratively. We cannot afford one organisation to go before the stream and we can't allow one area to go before the curve. We must, we must be in this in a unified messaging. So what is that unified messaging? The first thing is we need awareness, we need training. And so all programmes like this are being managed. So the Commission across the NHS is owned by Health Education England and Skills for Health. They will co-create accredited awareness and training modules from January 2022. We have been very clear as a clinical reference group, these must be focused on the types of context patients, families, citizens and carers find themselves in. So we are seeking for these to be specialised in health and the justice. We are seeking specialised modules for continuing healthcare. We are seeking specialised modules for, six, for 16 and 17 year olds. The basic awareness is excellent, but we also need to talk to areas of specialist services as well. We're also working with NHS Digital around the fact that clinical system suppliers and providers make the LPS minimum data set part of the, the fixes that need to happen. 
And also the data is collected not by massive spreadsheets. We are in 2021. We've had a digital enabled long term plan for the last five years. And so we are seeking a liberty protection safeguards data collection portal to be stood up in March 2022. This is not new and it is not solely about LPS. We have got to begin counting vulnerability and analysing vulnerability, including LPS, in a more measured, systematic, digital enabled way. In terms of clinical commissioning groups, integrated care systems will become responsible bodies and the legislation will take account of that. We know, for instance, that the executive chief nurse of the integrated care system will be executively accountable for all safeguarding programmes, and that will include the assurance process of LPS. But we need to be we need to be getting integrated care systems ready for that. And so we have launched uh, two weeks ago we have launched a readiness audit whereby clinical commissioning groups and interim integrated care systems can look at and critique their confidence in their system for readiness. That does include providers, that does include hospitals, but it also includes community services. It will include domiciliary services. It will include primary care services. Because only together when we're ready to move forward can any part of the system move forward. Obviously, we need transitional workforce. We're never going to do this. And this was a huge mistake made in the sort of implementation of PREVENT, the Counterterrorism and Radicalisation Programme. There was not sufficient transformation. And so therefore, we are going to stand up a regional LPS clinical leads from next month. We will also be looking to transform integrated LPS teams as well from around about March next year. This is all part of a pending bid that is sitting with the Department of Health to transform Europe's largest employer, the NHS, and independent providers with an NHS contract. I personally see this as a two year journey. We are never going to implement perfection in the 1st of April 2022. And so you have my commitment over the next two years that there will be transformation teams. They will probably sit in provider networks because what we do need is we need that resource to be shared. Integrated care needs shared resources. So whilst hospitals might want to appoint a specialist, that specialist might, if it's funded nationally, might need to reach out to primary care. Because as, as we've heard, you know, this thing about portability, it needs interoperability, it needs collaboration. So whatever team is stood up under the National Commission, we will make sure it covers primary care, it covers community services, and yes, it covers hospitals because that's where patient journey is important. And we've done, we've done this previously in terms of the programmes that you can see there, and we're also doing it currently with Domestic Abuse Act. So we are, we are absolutely on this track about collaboration and integration in order to get things set up. But I have to bear witness to the fact that this necessarily isn't even about the LPS code of practice. We can work our magic in the LPS arena. Whatever the code says, we can implement it over two years. However, for me, it's more about mental capacity awareness. We have got to begin looking at the lack of mental capacity awareness across the NHS. I'm often taken aback by chief nurses that don't know the difference between Mental Capacity Act and the Mental Health Act. And so we have a deal of opportunity, we have a deal of awareness to raise at a board level, at a senior manager level, at an operational level, at a caregiver level, in our homes and in our families and in our communities. We all must understand that. And so we are going now to begin launching awareness via social media, we're going to be creating a series of rapid reads. We're going to raise awareness. Towards April 2022. 
The specialism of LPS will happen, but the foundation of mental capacity at this time, at this juncture, in COVID recovery, it is far more important to do that. I'm going to stop there um, with a massive thank you for the, the 400 people that have attended here, and I'm hoping that we can continue these raising awareness sessions alongside you. Thank you for all you do, and thanks for listening. Um, Kenny, that's fabulous. Thank you very much. I'm going to take away the phrase calm the drama, uh, which I think I'm going to put on a, put on a poster above my desk. Um, I've been trying to scramble through the, the questions in the chat box and collate them um, into, into groups and themes. Um, could, uh, and I'll... Could, I, could I make a suggestion, Ben? Why don't well, you, in case you miss any, because every every question is useful. If you cut and paste the, the questions to me, I will work through these and create a rapid read, a Q&A back to you so that you can share it with the 390 participants. Let's not lose anything. That would be fabulous. Thank you but, uh, very yeah, much the indeed, themes. Uh, for, for that. I've, I have picked out some things. I was going to start with um, with one or two that I can tackle. The first is, is an apology to those who've uh, been having some technical difficulties and reassurance that the recording um, of the session and all the slides will be made available to, to everyone who signed up, including those who've not been able to attend uh, today. Um, so you will see all the content uh, and I'm sorry for those who've had some trouble along the way. Um, and let me echo the point you finished with, um, Kenny, before I, uh, I pick up some, some of the questions. Um, I have every sympathy um, with um, some of the many organisations I'm giving training to at the moment who say how difficult it is to get ready for the LPS without the flesh on the bones and without even really much confidence in the, um, the published time scale. Uh, because as, as Tim finished with, there's lots and lots of of questions, um, and there are, but absolutely taking the, the point you finished on, um, Kenny, you can get ready for the LPS now by getting the MCA right, um, and every scrap of time and effort that goes into getting the Mental Capacity Act um, well understood, well applied, um, is going to get you in the right place, whatever the LPS looks like, um, and whenever it comes along. So I was very pleased to hear uh, hear that point being made uh, made loud and clear. Um, let me let me go back to some of the questions. Um, one or two for you, please, Tim. If I can bring you back in, um, just on this um, on the issue of transition, um, a couple of things have come up. Um, what happens to the doles authorizations where referral has been made but they've not yet been processed, as at midnight on let's call it imaginary 31st of march 2022 suppose it is um i understand that doles referrals that have already been granted will continue to run for as long as they run and that's fine that gives you a transition um but the question is what about the backlog of unprocessed referrals already made um and the same question has been asked and it's the same issue i suppose about an application that's gone into the court of protection for a dollar in the community case um, where our experience is they're taking six, eight, ten months for the court to come back to us, uh, similar timescales sometimes to, to Dole's referrals. What, what happens with the backlog in transition or do we not yet know? Well, that, I, yeah, that we don't yet know because that's in the regulations, but the logic of what the government said is that um, uh, it's only when the authorisation is given that it, that it counts. So the referrals won't 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 count as a new as an existing doll's case. So if referrals have been made, then um, you know you've you've got you've got a choice basically. You either go put them on the deprivation of liberty safeguards, or you um, you take a legal risk and wait until the LPS comes into effect and try to maybe use the assessments that have been carried out or haven't been carried out. Um, in order to inform the the assessments that are needed for the um, for the liberty protection safeguards authorization, um, in terms of the second part around courts, um, we've no idea because um, all of that work hasn't been done by the co by the court of protection yet, um, yeah. and that won't be in the code. It won't be in the regulations. That's a sort of s separate work stream. So, I imagine, and this is just me speculating, 
that it would be a similar process that would apply under the LPS. So it would be authorizations given that would count. Everything else would go on to the responsible body. That's, but I've, I've got no grounds for saying that at all. Yeah, but it does leave leave the problem that um, you know, if you if you made a referral to Dole's now or to the Court of Protection for a, for a Dolan community today, there's a reasonable chance that it wouldn't have been processed and authorised, whether by Dole's or the Court, by the 31st of March. And at that point, you've got an unprocessed referral. Um, and if no new Dole's authorisations will be processed at that point, you've got to go back to square one and use use the LPS. Well, um, I, I, I mean, as I suggested, I don't think it is going back to square one. I think you can legitimately use a lot of the stuff you've generated for the dolls. I mean, if you've sat on this and done nothing, then yeah, you are starting from scratch. But yes. um, yeah, you know, the key thing is to start assessing these cases and to put information together to use them yeah. to inform the new the new decision. Yeah, well, that, that's absolutely the message we, we give, which is it's not OK to sit on an unauthorised doll for now, hoping that the LPS comes as cavalry uh, to, to give us a, a, an easier way to to address them. Um, not least because the arrival date of the LPS um, has gone back before and might well go back again. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question about the portability um, of, of LPS authorizations? Because um, uh, I think two or three uh, in the chat box have asked about this. Um, uh, there was a question mark about whether portability would apply just between different settings, but of the same type. So, for instance, different hospitals or different care homes. Um, can you say a little bit about uh, about that? Because as, as I understand it, it's about the tension between you know, predictability uh, and foreseeability, but having enough certainty um, in the authorization that, that it can't be can't be stretched so far as to dilute the safeguards uh, that, that it's intended to give. So, so, so my take on this is that it will be, depend to a large extent on how widely the the arrangements, the, the arrangements for, that authorise deprivation of liberty have been drawn up. So it is perfectly possible when, say, someone is um, admitted to hospital or something like that to draw up the arrangements to such an extent to cover um, various different aspects of that of that hospital. That would be absolutely fine. On the other the other end, what is less likely to be covered by an authorization are unforeseen circumstances which are going to need a new authorization. So I think there's a lot you can do under an existing authorization in terms of how you design the arrangements. But bottom line is, if it's something new, a new deprivation of liberty, which wasn't foreseen when you gave the authorization, you're going to need to think about a new authorization. Yeah. OK, thank you, Tim. Kenny, I've got one or two for, for you. And forgive me, because you have, uh, I think, often dealt with them in the chat box while while they came and went while Tim was speaking. But for the sake of people who may not have had the, the chat box open um, and to give you a chance to expand on them a little bit. Um, can I take you back to a question I get asked quite a lot, which is um, about the uh, the prospect of GPs in particular charging for their role and their involvement yeah. in this system? Um, and what do we know about that uh, and how it might work in practice? Um, we know that GPs are entitled to charge and that commissioners are entitled not to pay the fee. Uh, it's all well, you know, GMS contract. Um, however, this might be a moment to think differently about general practice. It might be a moment for primary care networks to stand up GPs of special interests or even practitioners with special interests delegated by the GP contractor system. My challenge with any of this, and I'm seeing a lot of workforce issues and provider funded posts coming into the chat. It is absolutely critical to understand that if you deploy an individual in a certain organisation, that's not collaborative because that person can't be there all the time to answer and respond. So my my advice to you as 380 people is where is your provider collaborative networks? Where is your primary care networks? And where is your adult safeguarding boards making us work together to recruit 2.47 whole time equivalents that will cover 52 weeks a year, 12 to 15 hours a day? We need to think how we staff and how we develop a workforce that's integrated. 
And so I, I wouldn't be looking for providers, whether it's primary care providers or foundation trust providers to recruit on their own. I'd be looking for people to, organisations to come together, recognise the importance of human rights, mental capacity, liberty protection safeguards and consent, because that's what we're talking about. And let's recruit together a workforce that can span before hospital, in hospital and then in recovery back at home. So I, I'm looking for an integrated workforce working with integrated tech um, because that's what that's what clients expect these days, Ben. Yeah, OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, another for you, please, Kenny. And again, I think it's been um, picked up in the, the chat box, but could you perhaps just expand a little bit on the the availability of uh, the the readiness audit yes. um, the, the state that's got to and how and when that might be uh, made available to others please and I'll, yep. while you're answering that I will read the essay that's just come into the chat box <laughs> yes uh, I've already read that um, uh, essay so it's, it's a useful one uh, from Paul and the the read the NHS readiness audit the first draft of it is due on the 30th of October it will be reported to the clinical reference group and shared with SAN members so eight 380 people on this call if you're not part of SAN do join the Safeguarding Adults National Network on the Futures NHS platform and you'll be given a copy version two will then go live and there'll be slightly different questions. So each version of it will be a slight iteration compared to what the code says, and also maybe perhaps when we get our business case from the Department of Health, the transformation budget as well. So it's got an iterative process, but the first version, the report with heat maps, the 30th of October. Okay, thanks, Kenny. Um, I will I will pass on Paul's point, and perhaps it's uh, it's one for you, Tim, if you don't mind. Uh, coming back to, I don't know if you've seen it in the chat box, but the the gist of it is the uh, the criticism of the post legislative scrutiny committee uh, of the state of dolls, and um, how how comfortable do you feel, Tim, that we're not going to be sitting here in ten years' time discussing the urgent need to replace the LPS, assuming, of course, the LPS have been implemented by them. <laughs> Yeah, and I suppose I, you know, we, we don't know, and I suppose it all is about um, implementation here, and you know, to what extent a decent system is going to be funded and and operated properly, and mm. the, you know, people take it, take it forward, and sort of uh, run with it. Um, but it, I mean, it's hard to know, and I, I suspect a lot of the problem here is Cheshire West. It's the judgment of the Supreme Court, which is causing, which has caused a lot of these problems. And to some extent, there's part of me that thinks that no system will ever be able to cope with um, the Supreme Court judgment. And until some of the issues um, around that judgment are, are, are addressed, then I, I, I think it will be difficult to get over, um, over some of the issues. But that's just my personal view. Mm, that's interesting. Thank you. I mean, p picking a point that you, you kind of alluded to earlier, but didn't didn't expand on, which I think is very important, is um, the, the safeguards under LPS don't just include the uh, the person's representative or an IMCA, but also the right to challenge, as you said, Tim, the, the role of the court of protection changes from being both, you know, route of appeal against Dole's authorizations and authorizer of a doll in the community uh, to become the route of appeal against both uh, effectively. And because the current section 21A route to court uh, to appeal against uh, or to challenge a doll's authorizations, uh, doll's authorization is retained, and non-means tested legal aid is a, is re going to be retained, and because the the group of people who are in the scope of LPS is, I don't know, twice as big, because it includes all other settings outside care homes and hospitals, it includes 16 and 17 year olds. Potentially, you've got I don't know twice as many people with the same um, access to non-means tested legal aid to challenge a doll's authorization or an LPS authorization as it will be in the Court of Protection. So for those who see um, a flood of work coming through the Court of Protection as symptomatic of a real problem with the doll system, I don't see how that goes away or gets any better. Um, and my guess would be it gets a whole lot worse in that sense. Um, there'll be twice as much work. I don't see why there wouldn't be. Uh, going through the Court of Protection under uh, under LPS. Um, can I ask about 
AMCP's role for, for you, please, Kenny. This has come up uh, a couple of times in the box about um, NHS trusts um, employing AMCPs or approving them. Um, I know we're still waiting for the regulations on the the kind of qualifications that, that they will need to have. Um, but can you say a little bit about the AMCP role, please, in, in the NHS it, context? Yeah, in the NHS. Uh, again, I would be advising that a collection of providers should recruit rather than being accountable in one organisation of a mothership trust. Uh, I think it, it might be a broader it might be a broader collection of providers, but they will employ them. Um, and the approval of them, as far as I can tell, will always be with a local authority. They will, they will be approved by the local authority. Certainly Health Education Eng England is currently finalising the commission to do uh, refresher training um, for best interest assessors and AMCPs as well. So that should be with us quite soon. I'm, I'm expecting about December, January, we should see that. So training by Health Education England modules, then approval by local authority and employment or deployment within collaborative partnership networks seems to be the most suitable way, maybe teams of them. I keep on coming back to this. If we are going to truly make this work across the NHS, we have to have people there seven days a week, at least eight hours a day. And for that, in my world as a, as a practicing nurse, you need 2.47 whole time equivalents. It is no use having someone as an 8B, a, a, a senior middle manager as an 8B when they've got six weeks leave and they can only work 30 to four, 37 and a half to 38 hours a week. You need 2.47 whole time equivalent working across a system would be my what I'm trying to get through into the fact that you need them seven days a week, 365 days a year. Kenny, in, in that sense, do you think there's there's positive um, benefit from the, the move from CCGs to ICS, ICB, I now hear responsibility for the, the community patients where they are CHC, but only as I understand it, CHC yeah. funded. Um, in well, that think... the ICS may be able to do things at bigger scale and more collaboratively, but I know that a lot of this is still being worked out. Uh, it's been it is being worked out, but you know, we have to re we have to recognise that a person, particularly children's journeys, so 16 and 17 year old, the conversation must start when that child is 14, if not younger. You cannot wait to the 16th birthday. You know, we've learned so much from looked after children and that transitional safeguarding. So let's start conversation with 14 and 15 year olds. But uh, integrated care system is the way to go. People don't live in the same borough next to a hospital where they receive care. That moment is gone. Ch children, adults, we travel across regions for our services and our care, particularly specialised care and mental health care. So we need this transferability, portability and when the, patient, when the person, the citizen has had their hospital moment of acute illness, and they've been medically um, uh, stabilised and they're fit for discharge, they have got to go back home. And home is not next to the hospital. Home may be regions away. It will certainly be several local authorities drive away. So we've got to begin looking at a footprint that is bigger if we're going to capture that someone's intervention in a hospital has a journey, a safeguarding journey before it, and they need a safeguarded journey of recovery after it. So I, I'm very keen to explore the population and cross border benefits of integrated care system for liberty protection safeguards, as I am for all adult safeguarding. You know, we don't live in the same borough in which we're treated. That moment has gone, it's passed, and it won't be coming back. Yeah, thanks, Kenny. And just picking up, um, I think someone's made a point in the in the chat box again about the the picture we're seeing now, particularly perhaps post COVID um, uh, and children and young people's mental health and the, and the importance of the point you make about planning the journey for that. And we've all seen things go wrong in transition from children's to adults uh, services um, as a problem. Um, let me pick a couple of points out about CCGs and ICS um, issues, um, perhaps one for, for each of you, 
please. Um, Tim, can I start with, with you? We've been asked, can CCG's ICS um, uh, bodies delegate their functions back to local authorities? Uh, it's all very well having this responsibility from local authorities shared onto the NHS, but can they just uh, section 75 subcontract it back? Yeah, I don't think there's any um, there's any uh, plans as far as I'm aware to um, change section 75. So that will continue to include most of most of the functions, including at the moment Dole's functions. So I'm sure that, you know, that will just be a consequential amendment to transfer that to LPS. Uh, the more interesting question is w whether the code of practice seeks to um, direct discretion in terms of delegating um, delegating functions. So I think that that might be something you see in the code. It might it might not, but um, I, I, I'm not aware of any proposals to um, significantly change Section 75. Yeah, so a bit interesting one. Having, as you say, having the legal power to to do it is is different, and um, you've got to balance the the policy of bringing the authorization and responsibility closer to the coalface, isn't it? That's the that's the point of it. But equally, when you fragment responsibility, you might then not have the depth of experience and expertise um, uh, available to to deal with things. I, I mean, I was thinking if, it, if I had my time again at the Law Commission and I was doing it now, that I would give um, integrated care systems a whole responsibility for um, for LPS. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it seems to be a much more positive way of going forward in terms of multi-agency working. But anyway, that's just my that's just one of the dreams I have at night. I, I think there is an option for your dream, Tim, if I, if I can be so bold. And uh, remember, integrated care systems are but one level. You have the integrated care board, you have the integrated care system, but you've also got the integrated care partnership. Surely LPS sits at that partnership level where you've got safeguarding adult boards, you've got ADA sitting there, you've got all an association of directors of children's services as well for 16 and 17 year olds. I think this is something that should be welcomed by integrated care partnerships. They may not have the funding, but they have the measure of population health. And for me at the moment, apart from COVID recovery, there is no greater uh, priority than uh, implementing the LPS because it's about human rights, mental capacity and consent. So I, I think let's work it at the integrated care partnership level as opposed to getting obsessed by putting the accountability at the integrated care board. Thanks, Kenny. Um, the uh, the other uh, question related to to ICS is, um, which I was going to ask you, please, was was the point about um, CQC oversight and regulation without yeah. CCGs or ICSs being you know, registered and inspected in the same way as a as a provider uh, organisation? Um, what do we uh, what do we make of that? I think it's an excellent uh, idea. So um, we are we are having we. Nationally, we've asked our regions to uh, have conversations about LPS or compliance, monitoring, assurance processes with providers and LGA representatives, local government representatives, and also ADAS and ADCS. So that will happen regionally. And in the meantime, the clinical reference group will be stood up to have conversations with CQC. Because we need we need everyone to be digital enabled. We need everyone to be analytically sound. So whether it's offset or CQC, you know, we we must be digital enabled in terms of getting the data in for monitoring, compliance, assurance, and scrutiny. Let's let's work this collaborative together. But nationally, we'll be we'll be liaising with CQC and Ofsted, and regionally, they will make things happen for providers and integrated care systems with ADAS, local government association, and the Association of Directors of Children's Services. Yeah, thanks, Kenny. And there's uh, there's quite a lot of support coming into the the chat box. The idea of um, scale uh, uh, and oversight. I think it is challenging to uh, for for it to be too fragmented at, at the level of individual organisations. Um, which uh, gives me, I'll just pick one more question out. Uh, there's more than we've been able to deal with, but let me finish with with one, uh, which is where these things often end up. Um, somebody's asked. Um, I paraphrase. Um, do, do NHS bodies know how much this is going to cost uh, and have the finance team been told? Um, what, what constitutes the NHS? So NHS bodies do have a flavour of how much interim plans might cost, but when you want integrated data sets, 
So I give you an example. Uh, one organization went and put, uh, began purchasing a piece of software, a uh, quarter of a million. Now, not, not every organization will require a quarter of a million software. LPS will not be a cash cow from the NHS. I, I need to make that very clear, whether it's training or whether it's IT or whether it's data sets, whatever it is, the NHS will not stand up a cash machine for providers and system suppliers. And so we need to work with NHS Digital around data capture. We, we cannot be handing public parcel of quarter of a million through every single provider in the NHS who will be a responsible body. It's just not going to happen. We are in COVID recovery. We've got a spending review. And so we need to come together and decide what the national offer is. And we need to cost that out. And that's why we've got the readiness audit. Yeah, uh, uh, agree, of course. And um, a lot of the drive and the context for this was doing things more cost effectively yeah. as well as effectively in protecting yeah. the, the rights of those involved. Um, I am sorry that there's questions um, in, in the boxes that we've not got to, but thank you ever so much to Kenny who's offered to kindly answer them all. Uh, so we will pass all them up and send them on, uh, which I'm thrilled about. Thank you both uh, ever so much for, for your presentations. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined. If you'd like to send any questions through to us, um, either contact me directly, uh, which is ben.troke, T-R-O-K-E, uh, hilldickinson.com, or use the, the general LPS queries uh, email uh, that we've set up there. Um, we will be sending copies of the, the slides and the recording of the session um, and perhaps that Q&A document, if we can work that up between us um, to, to follow up. Um, thank you all ever so much for, for joining us this time. I suspect we will have another session in another few months, uh, but we'll have a think about the timing on that uh, and see how long the spring of 2021 can go on for. Uh, until we do see the code, but we will uh, we will keep you all informed. Uh, if you're not already on our mailing lists, please do uh, sign up. We'll keep you posted. Um, thank you ever so much again to our, our speakers, Tim, Kenny, uh, for, for your insight um, and to everyone who has come along today. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to end the presentation now. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>